The Fourth Staller, Chapter 13. Later that day at lunch, Joe escorted Brady into my office. I'd, ha I'd had to fire someone er once before, uh, only once before, and it had been, hadn't been pleasant. Plus, I still liked Brady. I couldn't believe he would double cross us like that. What's up, Mac? Why is everyone acting so serious? He asked as he sat down. The jig is up, Brady. It's over, I said. He shook his head and furrowed his brow. Don't play dumb, Brady. I know what you've been doing, I said. Mac, I am not sure what you mean, he said slowly. I think you do know, I said. And it's over. You're fired. Why are you doing this, Mac? What about Fred? Who will watch over him? I need to be here. I need this job, Mac, he said. His face fell, and I could tell he was dropping He was dropping the act. I admit that I got into a bit of trouble. I mean, I guess I owe a lot of money to Staples. But I swear I'm on your side. That's why I'm on your side. I can't ever pay, pay back what I owe. So my only chance is to help you take out Staples before he takes me out. You know what? I asked him. I just don't care. I'm sick of being lied to. Whether you're telling the truth or not, I just can't trust you anymore. But he started and then he seemed to give up. He knew he had been had. He was had. Goodbye, I said coldly. coldly. I wanted him to break down. I didn't feel comfortable punishing him any further without full confession, but he just started crying. Tears of guilt buried his face. He just started crying tears of guilt and buried his face in his hands. I nodded to Joe. He lifted Brady out of the chair and escorted him out of the bathroom. I spent the rest of lunch convincing Great White, Nubby, and Kitten to stay on board with our business after what had happened to the other bullies. When I told them all about the rat and note I found in my locker, I wanted everybody to be extra careful, just in case, to try and stick together as often as possible. And I agreed to up their pay a little, by, a little in light of the increased danger for working for me. At afternoon recess, I organized another meeting between Joe, Vince, and me that night at Vince's place. It was probably especially dangerous time for us to be meeting near the creek, given the threats we'd received, but it was also important that we rotate our meeting place. Besides, it was kind of fun to visit our old trailer park once in a while. The purpose of this meeting was to move up the ladder. Now that we had our snitch situation taken care of, it was time to strike a real blow against Staples. We need a new plan, I said, as the three of us played video games in Vince's room. I think we need to go straight to the top of this, straight to the top this time. What? We can't go after Staples. We get wasted. I heard here he's got pit bulls chained up near his office, Joe said. You're right. That'd be crazy. We don't even know how to get to Staples. We don't know what he looks like or where he lives, but we can go after Justin Johnson. He runs the business at our school, and without him, Staples will have nothing here. He takes the money and bets. I bet he also does some of the bribing of athletes and stuff, too. I think that if we take out Justin we can deal Staples business a pretty good blow, I said. Let's do it, Vince said. What are we going to do though? Vince asked, as in the video as as in the video game I got my revenge by dropping a grenade onto his character after he walked into my trap. I don't know. You guys got any ideas, I said. Mac, that's perfect, Vince yelled. What you just did to Joe in the game, I mean, we could do the same thing to Justin Johnson. It'd be like when Ronald Reagan was obsessed with Star Wars, that he totally blew the U.S. chance of getting out of the Cold War before the 19th century, before the 1990s, before 1990. I shook my head inside. Vince references his history stuff a lot. He's really good at school and reads a lot of huge, dusty books from the nonfiction section of the library that I wouldn't touch with a 10-foot pole. Vince grinned at me and said, just try to imagine a chimpanzee named Bonzo with strings attached to his hands and feet like a puppet, and it'll make sense. I laughed, but of course, it still didn't make any sense at all. Once Vince started pulling out monkey references, it was time to move on, or he'd start saying some really bizarre stuff. Look, guys, I hate to interrupt, but even if we do trap Justin, what are we actually going to do to him? We can't exactly blow him up with a grenade like in the game. Joe said. We'll make him an offer he can't refuse, I said. Like I said, I always try to say to say that I, as often as possible. I love that movie. I think it's called The Godfather, but it doesn't have any pizza in it. And it's just about some guy's crazy godparents or anything. Or anything. So don't let the title mislead you. 
I know I'd never want to watch a movie about my godfather, Uncle Bruce. He smells funny, like a hospital, specializing in chemical burns. And he always punches me in the arm and calls me kiddo, like we're in some lame TV show or dis uh, on Disney. Once during a family reunion, I saw my Uncle Bruce peeing off the balcony of his hotel room. I heard my parents say something about him falling off a wagon. I think maybe he hit his head pretty hard when he fell off the wagon and is now brain damaged or something. What does that mean, an offer he can't refuse? You're always saying weird stuff like that, Joe said. But he, but he was laughing. I swear, sometimes I think you two are the strangest kids on earth. I grinned. It was times like that that I realized how close Joe was to becoming an adult. Vince and I spent the, few, the next few minutes filling it, Joe in on what we had in mind. And I have to say that it was a pretty good plan. Vince and I smiled at each other as we discussed it. And even Joe was smiling by the time we finished explaining. But then I wasn't sure if Vince was smiling because he liked the plan or because we had just snuck up behind me in the video game and swiftly stabbed my character in the back. We got hung out to play video we hung out to play video games for another hour or so, then Joe had to leave. What are you guys doing this weekend? He asked as he put on his jacket. We're going to the lake with my family, I said, so take the weekend off. All right, sounds good, he said. Vince and I still had a few a few to find time to start planning the trip with everyone else, with everything else going on. And this, sec this, this seemed like a good chance to start. Normally talking about the Cuds winning the series before it actually, it actually, before they actually do would be a huge jinx. And we probably were ruining it for all Cubs fans right then and there in Vince's broom. But it was a necessity for for us. Two sixth graders can't up and go to a world series game on the spur of the moment. And even as scared as a cu as sacred as a Cubs World Series required careful planning, it went above the jinx. So you think that we should just go cheap and sit in the nosebleeds or try to go all out and sit in the lower section, I said. I want awesome tickets, of course, but we can't afford them with you handing out our money like political pamphlets. The good ones are going for over 2,700 bucks, right? A, a piece right now. We may, we may not even be able to get to the cheap seats at this rate, Vince said. That's so much money, Mac. I mean, just think about it. I know that's a lot, Vince, but we, what choice have, have I had? We're in this for the long haul now. I don't think we can hold back. Besides, the bullies have helped us. We've, we're, closing, we've, we're close to ending this whole thing. Maybe, Vince said, but it didn't seem like he was really thinking about the Cubs game anymore. He was just kind of looking out the window with eyes that resembled glazed donut holes. What was with him lately? I guess the stress of this Staples business was really getting to him. Which game should we try for? One, seven? I asked. Vince pondered this with the same glassy-eyed stare he'd had for much of the night. Then he finally said, I think we should just go for the first game, because what if the kids choke like they always do and get swept? Then we, then there wouldn't be a seventh game, and we'd miss our chance to see a World Series game at Wrigley, possibly forever. I nodded. I know it must seem like we're pretty negative fans, but that's the way you're supposed to think if you're a Cubs fan. Otherwise, you just get your heart broken again and again and again. Right now, you're probably thinking, no way. There's no way this little sixth grader could have enough money to buy two tickets to the game that ex this expensive. And you know what? It does seem a little ridiculous. But Vince is a great business manager. He kept us on track saving money religiously for four years, and the business did pretty well. So there was a lot of money to save. Besides, we also get money from allowance and birthdays, too. Plus, we have no bills to pay for, for like, cars, for, like, for cars or rent. Nothing outside our normal business expenses. Add all that up, and we've amassed a pretty large pile of cash inside my closet. How much? Well, Vince would be the guy to tell you for sure because he's the one who keeps who kept track. But I believe at this at the time, the two funds combined with our regular savings would have equaled about six thousand dollars, which is totally mind-bogglingly crazy. But we did run a pretty tight little operation, like I said. Like I said before, well, we should probably worry about getting rid of staples before we worry about seats to buy, because if we don't do that, then there won't be a Cubs game for us at all, I said. I think the new plan will work, though. It's kind of like my grandma said, there ain't no use in whining like a, like a sharecropper when it's raining raisins and acrobats. Gross, I said, but laughing anyway. Okay, Mac, I've got this. Vince said, what do you know, what, you know a better way to take out Staples operation, I asked, hopefully? Vince smiled, no, no, I've got a club Cubs question that's sure to crown me champion. 
Ready? I nodded and rubbed my temple. Oh, on what day and against wit what pitcher did Ernie Banks get his 500th home run? Ooh, tricky. I know that was May 12th, 1970, against Atlanta. But the pitcher, that's not really fair multiple part question, Vince. It's like, a two, it's like two separate questions, I said. Hey, remember the time you hit me with that double question on Ron Santo? He had a good point. I resumed rubbing my temple and closing my eyes. After a moment, I f after a few moments, I smiled. Pat Jarvis. Vince shook his head in defeat. I really thought I had you that time. All right, I better go. It's getting late. I'll see you tomorrow. Remember, we're leaving around seven in the morning for the lake cabin, I said. My parents rented a lake cabin a few weekends every year, and they usually let me bring Vince uh, let me bring Vince with. That makes doesn't make sense. Anyway, okay, Max, see you. Outside, I hopped on my bike. It was fall, so it was already dark enough, dark even though it was only eight o'clock. That made it especially creepy being this close to the creek. I crept through an alley across from Vince's trailer park because it was a shorter route to my house. That's when two headlights popped up behind me. I was turning to look back. Some car was turning into the alley. Perfect timing. I thought my eyes squinted into the bright, perfect timing, I thought, as my eyes squinted into the bright lights. I turned into someone's back driveway to let the car pass, though, because there wasn't enough room for a bike and a car in that narrow alley. But it didn't go. It just sat there at the entrance, with its lights on and its engine running. I wondered if it was just waiting for me to go through first. I decided that must be the case, and I rode back into the alley. Then I heard gravel crunch behind me as the car started driving forward. What was this jerk doing? The car's headlights flicked as much, much, a much brighter shade of whitish blue and blinded me. I heard the engine rev and the car surged forward even faster. I remembered the note from the locker saying I'd be roadkill if I e didn't hand over Fred. My heart began beating so fast and so high in my chest that I felt like I was choking on it. I turned and pedaled, pushing as hard as I could as the car gained on me. There was there were six foot wooden fences on either side of me nowhere to go but the end of the alley or the underside of the car my lungs pumped as my calves burned i heard the car just a few feet behind me i was a dead man i knew it but i put on a burst of speed and cleared the alley turned right as sharply as i could go as i could onto the sidewalk my bike slid underneath me and i fell on top of it onto the grass the car exited the alley and screeched to a halt as it as it tried to turn right with me I was going too fast and fishtailed out into it was going too fast and fishtailed out into the middle of the street. Under the street lights I could see that it was an older red sports car with faded black racing stripes on the hood. The windows were tinted and I couldn't see who was driving it, but I didn't really have time to examine any closer because the car suddenly lurched forward and then turned to face me. I quickly got back on my bike and drove toward my house as the car bounced up onto the sidewalk after me. I couldn't believe it. The driver was actually trying to hit me. I felt, felt the headlights engulf me as the car got closer. He was driving up on the sidewalk and even on people's yards. I envisioned myself being crushed underneath an old sports car in somebody's front lawn while the family inside grouped around the window and watched. They would all be drinking huge cups of hot cocoa. I shook off the image and veered my bike across somebody's front yard and around to the back of the house where there wasn't room for a car to follow me. I tried to stay low as I rode through that alley and then through another yard, zigzagging madly through the alleys and yards. I made my way towards my house. The car drove by a few times, but each time I was able to duck behind the fence or trash can. It also helped that there were no street lights in the alley. Eventually, I drove up the sidewalk to my house. I typed in the code for the garage and it opened, spilling light onto the driveway. As I walked my bike inside, I heard a car screech to a halt right in front of my house. The red sports car sat there under the street lamp with its headlights still on. I could feel the driver staring at me. I looked right to where I thought his head would be and stared back. It was pretty safe inside my garage, but the chill went up my spine anyway. The car sat there for at least two minutes. Then my dad came into the garage and the Greg car drove away. Hey, who was that? He asked. I don't know. I think it was some pizza guy looking for a house, I said. He nodded. Close the garage door. You're letting bugs in. He went back inside. I wanted to tell my dad. I really did. I mean, I always try to keep my business and my family separate, but something, someone had just tried to kill me. There's nothing I wanted to do more right then than tell my parents. But I still couldn't say anything. 
the Cubs game is too important and getting my parents involved would only risk us not being able to go. For one, they call the cops and once the cops got involved, I run the risk of having to come clean about my funds. No adult was going to let a kid keep six grand in the closet. Also, if my parents thought that someone was out to kill me, they'd go into super overprotective mode, which means they definitely nix our plans to go to the Chicago to Chicago with Vince's brother. I wanted my parents' help, but this was something I would have to deal with myself. It was the only way. Besides, this wasn't my parents' problem, it was mine. They had enough to worry about. <laughs>